mute your computer. To mute your uh, computer, as to avoid the background noise, and also to check your microphone and your uh, camera. Okay. As you can see from the conference program, we have one hour and fifteen minutes to present a number of four papers that covers the second session topic, which is communication and social interaction during the global pandemic. Every presenter has 15 minutes for presentation, followed by uh, five minutes for uh, questions and answers. If you exceed the, the time, I will uh, warn you with uh, heart. Do you see the heart? <laughs> and uh, I hope uh, not to to rate you with the second uh, with the second um, icon because it's like this. <laughs> okay, I hope to give only hearts. And uh, before we start, um, um, uh, I will also invite you to have your coffee or a cup of tea if you have. A uh, mug near next to you. Feel free to have it. Um, if everything is all right, uh, shall we start? Shall we start? Um, I will invite uh, the first uh, paper and the first authors, uh, Elisabetta Adami and Emilia Jonov from the University of Leeds and Macquarie University from Australia to present uh, the paper, Everybody Acts of Social Semiotic Inquiry, Insights into Emerging Practicing During the Pandemic. Hello, yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen and um, Can you see? Yes. My presentation. Yes. Good. I can see. Good. So thank you very much. Do Rob. you mind oh. that we can see the notes as well? Oh no! Do you, oh no! That that's not the one. Then wait. You need to share your other screen. If you oh yes, it. I got it now. Is that okay now? Yes, it's okay yeah. now. Yeah, okay, good. So you can, you have the floor, please. Yes, good, Becca. yes. Um, uh, hello, so um, um, the, the work we, that Amelia and I are presenting today has been done in collaboration with uh, our core researchers, and you find the names uh, there in the slide to the right, um, who are the actual producers of the Everyday Acts of Sociosemiotic Inquiry that we'll present. Um, we will present the first findings on data produced in a collective research project that we shared in April 2020, soon after the World Health Organization um, declared uh, COVID a pandemic. Um, so we started the project in April 2020, and it's um, the project is PAM Mimic, Communication and Interaction in the Pandemic and Beyond. It's an international core reflective research initiative and transmedia space that has involved both academics and non-academics in the sharing of experiences and reflections on how the pandemic has changed the ways in which we communicate and interact with others. Um, the founders, we founded it uh, together with other 30 scholars in multimodality based in all continents across the globe. Each member functions as a node to involve their own social networks in contributing to share reflections. Core research is made through the sharing of observations through live public conversations online and the transmedia space centers around a website that's connected to social media, social media profiles on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WeChat and Weibo for China. In the first five months, uh, we have involved over 1,500 people across these online platforms. And you can see some other numbers in the slide for only the first five months. The, the Facebook group has been particularly rich in discussions. And the Facebook group is the data that we will focus on in the analysis today. 
you know, in July last year, we published a manifesto that traced the main coordinates of the changes to communication and social interaction by drawing on our observations and the discussions taking place in the transmedia space. The manifesto identifies key changes along five main dimensions, mediation, channels of perception, semiotic resources, mini-making mini practices, and the interaction order. But I will not go into the details in each. Well, you can, you can read the manifesto yourself in case you're interested. But the key aspect for the focus of our talk today is the assumption that we started um, this project with that because we all had to undergo a redisciplining process uh, to find new ways to interact with others and carry out daily activities, we've been much more aware and prone to meta reflection. And we've all been in an exceptional moment of distributed semiotic knowledge in the making. So, Pamimic, we started the core research initiative from the need to document and make the best of the semiotic knowledge being developed while the awareness was heightened. And here today, we are presenting the preliminary findings on the dynamics of distributed semiotic knowledge in the making. Now, I'll leave it to Emilia to introduce the frameworks that we used. Okay. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. In terms, of, in terms of the theories and the methods that underpin this work, Panamimic is in a, in a very significant way inspired by citizen sociolinguistics as proposed by Betsy Rhymes. Now, um, what we have done here is to extend essentially the principles of citizen sociolinguistics to multimodality and multimodal communication and interaction during the pandemic. Citizen sociolinguistics is about everyday talk about language, but it also is everyday talk about language. So it is analogous to citizen science in that it is a participatory collective approach to research about language in society. And its aims are also analogous in that it aims to reconceptualize what counts as expertise, in this case, expertise about language in society, uh, to bring different voices together and thereby to help us overcome blind spots and stimulate grassroots social action and change when it comes to language and communication. Talk about language, Rhymes argues, can, and I quote, make visible otherwise unseen aspects of language and communication, building expanded awareness of language diversity and change and its role in society, and especially help us learn about how and why people value and validate certain linguistic forms and variations in their use. It's a source of important yet very often overlooked language expertise. Every conversation about language is thus an act of citizen sociolinguistics. It can be triggered by wondering or curiosity or by critique, uh, but it is um, valuable. What happens there is that people, anyone involved in such conversations about language, these people are citizen sociolinguists. They're at the same time participants in this inquiry, they simultaneously contribute their perspectives on language, and there are also researchers engaging in a form of inquiry that can extend their own and uh, others who participate their knowledge about language. So the success of citizen sociolinguistics is not in actually observing and documenting certain uh, practices when it comes to using language, but in its ability to draw together voices who might otherwise not necessarily interact. And so in this way, to raise awareness of and promote deliberation discussion discussion among these diverse perspectives on language. And so Rhymes also suggests a number of steps for conducting a citizen sociolinguistic inquiry. So we might start with formulating a question and then look for um, responses, answers to that question by looking for data that might be available on the internet, or we might initiate di dialogue about that particular question or create a forum such as what we've done here with Panmimic to discover diverse perspectives and adopt in all of that, we need to adopt an open source approach so that the data is freely available to everyone, especially the contributors. And similarly, when we analyze and interpret the data, we disseminate the findings and invite feedback on our interpretations. So what we've done here is to expand citizen sociolinguistic principles to multimodal interaction and communication. But Mimic then makes and draws on the assumption that whenever we are discussing or commenting on semiotic practices, people are acting or we are acting as social semioticians, engaging in the form of inquiry that contributes to what Adami and Ramos Pinto have called shared semiotic knowledge. Um, could we have the next slide? Um, 
Yes. So this aligns very well then with how social semiotics has been defined, particularly in Van Leeuwen's work, as always being interdisciplinary and therefore requiring different perspectives, but also as being open for anyone to engage in, so long as they engage in these three um, activities that are often interrelated. So collecting and documenting and systematic cataloging semiotic resources, including thinking about their history, exploring how they're used in specific socio-historical and cultural contexts, how people talk about these resources and how they legitimate them, contributing to the discovery and development of new resources, new semiotic practices. And so that also then aligns with um, Cress's argument that we need to recognize the expertise and the interests that any meaning makers uh, especially children, we need to recognize the interest that they bring to multimodal meaning making. And of course, that also then aligns and we're inspired by ethnography, where, as Heinz argues, the general population is respected as having a knowledge of their worlds, intricate and subtle in many ways. We also draw on critical and multimodal discourse analysis, and particularly that uh, emphasis in Van Leeuwen's work in particular on uh, the fact that when we're looking at discourse about semiotic or social practices, that can tell us more um, things that, you know, just looking at the practices themselves can't necessarily tell us, because it can tell us about how people value these practices, how they legitimate them, and so on. So there is value in looking at uh, discourse about these practices as well. So. Uh, what we're interested in is both uh, the semiotic learning about the semiotic practices that people have adapted or invented for communication during the pandemic, and also how and why these practices have come about and are valued by those who engage in these practices. And on to Elisabetta. <laughs> yes, so uh, let's go to the analysis now. The first case, very quickly, we examine here is an emerging semiotic practice being shared. I hope you can read um, a bit, but I'll, I'll drive you through the, the main points um, there. Anna's post shown here opens with three personal life events as evidence of the hardship that's caused by the ban of touching others. Then she says in the second paragraph, to hug people I am familiar with, I have come up with a technique. So that is a, a coping semiotic practice that she's created. She then describes it. I ask them to turn around and hug them from behind. I place my cheek on their shoulder blade. Then she provides contextualization. Under other circumstances, my co-workers would react, but they seem to appreciate it. So she ends with by validating, um, with validation through the response received. Then uh, Letizia comments afterwards. She legitimizes the practice through personal evaluation. I like your technique. She labels it. I call it the backpack hug. And then she introduces a personal variant describing it. And that's always initiated by a request. I ask them to, to turn around. But then the both of them turn uh, their backs um, against each other. And she adds an imagery like bears rubbing against trees to strengthen the visual rendition. Then a second uh, person comments, um, she consented and contributed to our analysis, but prefers to remain anonymous. So she opens by thanking Anna and Letizia for the suggested practice, and then she motivates her contribution with an extremely sad personal experience. Her grandmother died and she finds it very hard not to be able to hug her dad. Um, to console him. And then she announces her uh, eagerness to adopt Anna's suggested practice. And uh, look at that. I can't wait to give him a backpack hug. So she commits to adopting it, but and also adopts the label that Letizia, uh, that, uh, Letizia gave to, um, to the practice. So when we later contacted her for the analysis of the exchange, she wrote to us that gave me hope I could have my dad at my grandmother's funeral. It was sort of awkward, but I was happy to know I could if I felt to, the need to, which I did. So she, she gave us um, evidence that the exchange contributed to the actual spread of this new semiotic practice. Uh, so this is what we call a banal, following Cress, a banal example of semiotic knowledge in the making. And as to its dynamics, in this case, the semiotic practice is described in its multimodal deployment, motivated through personal perspective, legitimized in its context of applicability, 
codified through labeling and provided with the variant. It is in some a brief yet extremely articulated case of semiotic knowledge about an emerging practice being co-constructed and shared. The transnational reach that social media allows um, uh, for this to happen, it allows for this to happen beyond one's Im immediate personal networks. These people are all based in different countries and didn't know each other before. It shows uh, this example shows the role and dynamics of everyday acts of socio-semiotic knowledge and distributed expertise in society. Now I'll leave to Emilia to discuss our second case. I'll try and be very brief. Now, in this case, what we're trying to illustrate is that Panemic also functions as a, state, uh, a space for engaging with different voices and negotiating and legitimating semiotic practices. So what we have here is an example in which we have the opening post by Chris, where he wonders, could mask wearing lead to more people learning sign language? And this question, which Rhyme might call wonderment, is motivated by a news announcement. So entering an external voice, the news announcement, and more specifically the comment to that news announcement, where um, this external voice too, if you like, brings in an additional external voice because uh, that person is commenting and saying how a hearing impaired friend um, suggested that if hearing people can't lower their masks to enable lip reading, then they should learn sign language. Now, we have then another internal panemic member voice by uh, Farid here. And you can see he quickly responds to Chris's question by saying, not really. But then he goes on to, um, uh, or launches, if you like, into what Rhymes would call a sociolinguistic citizen arrest. So he challenges the comments authenticity, he questions whether it really represents a hearing impaired friend, and this reflects a critical orientation to discourse, especially towards discourses opposed to those of infection control and prevention. So he argues that sign language and lip reading are not the only way that uh, people communicate, and that using speech to take steps and other technologies are standard practice for many, uh, for most or all, in fact, deaf people, he argues. And so then we also have that he brings in external voice four by linking to AbilityNet organization's uh, webpage where they describe a few of those apps. And we have Bethan here also adding that similar concerns about masks have been raised by deaf communities and UK media. So this comment is not the only one that uh, perhaps should be questioned. Um, we then see uh, how more voices come in. We have Elisabetta here arguing against such generalizations and arguing that her hearing impaired friends find that such apps don't really provide an easy fix. And then we have, uh, again, Bethan adding in another point that uh, British Sign Language at least relies on things that can be obscured, non-manual features that can be obscured by wearing a mask. So he's responding to both Chris and Farid. And then we have Marie, adding the fact, uh, again, arguing, uh, agreeing with Farid that, okay, well, this could be an anti-mask kind of um, comment and that there are speech conversion apps that are indeed excellent and yet elderly people might not use them and also there are many situations in which it may be too noisy and also people might find it uneasy to have to um, use those apps and ask people to repeat so that the app can work to repeat what they've just said and so on. Anna then provides another example in which a deaf shop owner had asked her to stand two meters back from him and lower her mask so he could um, lip read but he kept his mask on so enabling effective communication at the same time as sort of keeping the risk of infection uh, low and Anzia then shares a link to a YouTube video where we have a hearing impairing influencer and inclusion advocate um, Jessica Kelgren Potter discussing whether clear masks are helpful um, and the next one yes, do we have that already uh, oh, you probably don't have it Anyway, what we have afterwards is that we invited Emma uh, to join the discussion. Uh, she is a pandemic member, member, and we thought uh, we wanted her to bring in a first-hand perspective as a member of the deaf community as well. So then she uh, outlined quite a few arguments why she wouldn't make the kind of generalizations that uh, Farid has made, arguing, for example, that there are international studies that show hearing impaired teenagers prefer to text rather than sign in public spaces. And, um, and he, she responded to a lot of the other comments as well. 
And Farid then responded to Emma and compared some of the difficulties that hearing impaired people might be experiencing to difficulties that people not speaking the majority language might be experiencing um, in certain situations. So uh, at the end of all that, we shared uh, our analysis with all of these people who were involved from pandemic and sought their feedback. So what is interesting to note here is that in this very long exchange, what we have is not only participants sharing their rich knowledge about a range of different semiotic resources, technologies and practices, but also demonstrating their critical awareness of an orientation to various discourses and ideologies, ableist ideologies and ageist ideologies, as well as language ideologies, discourses of infection prevention and discourses of inclusion in communication. Now, this critical awareness both relies on and reflects what Rhymes would describe as nuanced attention to human interaction in its situational literacies, sorry, intricacies. For us then, this exchange illustrates what we think is a key advantage of Phonemic as a collective research forum. Um, its potential for uh, encouraging sustained dialogue, including diverse voices, to stimulate changes towards what we hope would be more inclusive, effective communication and interaction practices during the pandemic, but hopefully also beyond. So. Yes, and so to conclude, taking from uh, what Emilia just said, uh, we follow rhymes and then readapt it in proposing a new form of inquiry that recognizes everyday conversations about semiotic practices rather than just language as not only an area of inquiry, but also as a locus of expertise and a means of sharing knowledge. The cases examined here show people's role as socio-semioticians themselves in not only creating, but also sourcing, witnessing, describing, supporting, evidencing and counter-evidencing, labeling, codifying, legitimating, counter-arguing and negotiating semiotic practices by drawing in new voices and in so doing co-created share semiotic knowledge. Our findings show also people's contributions as discus analysts themselves who have analytical insights and critical approaches to discuss. Validity of findings in this type of everyday form of semiotic inquiry is built through participation. It is contextual, detailed and relevant to those who contribute so differently conceived than what we use in science. And in this, the affordances of social media platforms offer some advantages. They enable reach beyond the pub chat, beyond the limitations of physical space and movement, and they allow for recording and tracking and tracing these interactions. And finally, we have offered, hopefully, a glimpse into the benefits of adopting a, an engaged and involved stance to research with us as academic semioticians joining in as part of these everyday inquiries into semiotic practices, because these can help uh, leading, prompting grassroots change. And these are the references if you want to know more, but we're just at the beginning. And so that's it, we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Elisabetta and Emilia. If any of the attendees uh, have questions, please uh, feel free to address it. No questions for Elisabetta and Emilia. Uh, you can also uh, write question on email. Uh, I don't know if Elisabetta and Emilia um, display her um, their email address. So if you think about their research paper, you can address the question via email. Now uh, I invite uh, the second uh, presenter. To, to have the floor, uh, Adina Ionescu, Corina Buzoianu and Monica Bură from the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration to present their work. Uh, one second to share my screen. Okay. Okay, uh, could you see it? It's okay? Yes? No. Uh, so, hello everyone. Good morning. I hope your energy levels are, are higher. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, Emilia and Elisabetta, it was a very interesting presentation. I will uh, have the 
the, the stick now. And uh, today, I will talk about how young people perceive an alternative digital way of transmitting the messages of a public health campaign during the pandemic. So our paper title is, Does it have to be human to be credible? Uh, about the perception of avatar deliver messages about COVID-19 hygiene rules among young people. Uh, so, as we can see, and this well known and documented in the literature, our youth, especially millennial and Gen Z, is digitally savvy. So enthusiastic about virtual spaces and adventurous and experimenting things online. Understanding the background, um, we can see that young people are open to virtual spaces and to, um, towards changes proposed by them. And they are more accepting of disruptive ways of things, of doing things and communicating as well. So we find ourselves in a pandemic where the rules of the communication are overthrown and more fake news and disinformation try to fill the informational gap. So this is a problem. And this is why we need fast, reliable and cost-effective alternatives to human speaks post spokesperson because the rules need to be shared rapidly and persuasively for each category. So it is, uh, th this is the, the point where digital avatars could uh, engage and young people are very familiar with avatars in contexts like video games or social media platforms, but digital agents are not used in public communication campaigns or as a uh, possible alternative to humans. So this study, uh, what we want to see in this study is if virtual agents could be an effective way to spread the word uh, about COVID-19 hygiene rules. So in order to examine that, uh, seven hypotheses were formulated. Well, we wanted to examine if there are any differences between a message delivered by an institutional affiliated avatar represented as being part of the Department of the Emergency uh, Situations in Romania and a non-affiliated avatar, a more casual one to say so, closer to how citizens could see a normal person. We also wanted to see if our personal ideology how we see the world, our worldview, would affect how we analyze the source and the credibility of the message. So in order to understand the variables in this study, I will provide an overview. And the first is about uh, the avatar. Avatar is more represented in the literature and in the virtual world as an image of oneself in a virtual space created and controlled by him. But in this study, we defined it as a lifelike simulation of a human representation creating with computing technology. Next, we have message credibility or how accurate, trustworthy, and believable a message is. Literature showed that the source of the message is very important to its credibility, but other factors could be important too, like the context or the, um, the communication channel that is used for the message to be delivered. And finally, speaking about individual's ideology, uh, Sylvan Tompkins created a scale named the polarity scale analyzing how people see the world, the, our worldviews, being put on a spectrum from humanist to normativist. Humanism is based on, is inclined more on the left spectrum of the, of the political spectrum or more democratic worldviews when all humans are seen as good natures and humanists, according to the literature, are more experimental, less judgmental, as in well, accepting various uh, aspects of human experience, like different sexual orientations, race, behaviors, even cultures, and are more agreeable and empathetic. Uh, opposing them, obviously, are normatives that uh, they are viewing the world in a more essentialist way, where structure, order, rules, they are prior to humankind and they need to be respected and followed in order to keep under control the weak and flawed, uh, the, the nature of the individuals, because normatives think about people as essentially bad in essence. So this scale, the, the polarity scale, was predominantly used in political and voting behavior, but little research was implemented to use this scale on a virtual space or an agent. Uh, in order to, to test our hypothesis, a quantitative methodology was used. We conducted an online experiment in March 2021. Um, and, I'm sorry, uh, I'll manage the second session. 
Yes. I, I guess someone is not muted. Uh, our um, statistical analysis was carried out with one-way ANOVA, descriptive analytics, one-way ANOVA, factor analysis, and Cronbach's alpha for the reliability of the, um, of the scales. And as we can see, um, a sample of 151 participants was used in this study. It is a preliminary study, so uh, we want to see how and if the variables are, uh, are correlated in any way so we can have uh, a larger data to research um, afterwards. So uh, as you can see, uh, the majority of our, uh, of our participants are females. 74.2% and our males are 25.8% uh, and the uh, participant uh, with a median age of 20 years. Participants were recruited from first year students as the, at the National School of uh, Political Studies and Public Administration from a social psychological course and from a Facebook group dedicated to college students. So the majority of our respondents live in the urban area and the students uh, are, um, are diverse in, uh, in their majors, like communication, psychology and education, law, computer science, etc. And the sample gather people from main urban uh, areas, such as Bucharest, Cluj, Timisoara, Iași, Oradea, and Constanta. Um, our model contains three steps. So uh, in the beginning, participants completed this, uh, a survey with multi polarity scale. The, the scale for, uh, for personal ideology on Qualtrics, a digital platform for, for data gathering and uh, research, for us answering the modified polarity scale for assessing their personal ideology. After that, they were being split into two groups, two experimental groups and one control group, uh, being randomly but equally assigned a stimuli, a video of one minute where an avatar um, would list the hygiene rules for COVID-19, or in the control group where they will see an image with the rules written, simply as that. After watching the video or seeing the, the image, the participants would fill a post-experiment survey uh, consisting of four general questions and a message credibility uh, for all the groups and for uh, other skills for analyzing um, avatar trait, perception of the message source and homophily for the experimental group who were, um, who were exposed to, to, the, uh, to the avatar. So this is our avatar, Meet Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia is a virtual human representation, a virtual avatar that we created in uh, the free trial of the iClone 7 program for modeling 3D characters and rendering software programs. Uh, we chose a female because past literature states that female avatars were more persuasive than male avatars and per that participants tend to have an in-group bias, uh, preferring an avatar which is the same gender as them. So for our sample, it was very, uh, very good. In accordance to previous literature, we keep, we want to keep the human touch and even if it's in a virtual space and it will a virtual agent, we chose to have her voice recorded instead of adding a robotic voice. So the audio file was the same for both version of the stimuli and this is the audio. I hope you can hear it. Spălați-vă pe mâini cu apă și săpun minimum 20 de secunde. Okay, so this was the, the voice of Silvia. Now you know her in and out. Uh, and now that we have explored the proposed model and methodology, I would like to move on to the key findings of the paper. Um, in the first step of data analysis, we tested whether the perceived traits of the avatar, uh, attractiveness, trust, uh, expertise, humanness, or eeriness, uh, vary depending on the experimental groups. On this purpose, we test and we ran an innovative test to trial the hypothesis one, two, three of the study, and specifically we assess whether the exposure to an expert or versus non-expert uh, avatar will have an effect on the perceived features of the avatar within the experimental groups. No significant differences between experimental groups was found, but as you can see on average, um, new non-expert avatar was perceived as more attractive as we, uh, as we think, because it was more casual, it has some makeup, it wasn't um, created stereotypingly the smart, uh, the smart uh, person, and the expert avatar was seen as less credible. 
Moving on, in the second step of the data analysis, one way ANOVA was conducted in order to assess whether the exposure to an expert versus non-expert avatar will have an effect on the message credibility within the two exper experimental groups. So no significant differences between experimental groups was found, but on average, message credibility was not differentiated between groups. And we could affirm that maybe a possible factor for this result well, could be the type of the message we chose, the hygiene rules for COVID-19, because they were repeated over and over again across multiple channels from the beginning of the, of, of the pandemic, so one year ago. So the problem maybe is not about the credibility anymore because it is seen as a very high um, credible message. Other assumptions of our research were related to the humanistic versus normative orientation of participants and how this, uh, the traits of the avatar, the, how this orientation affects the perceived traits uh, of the avatar and messages. Considering the score obtained on the polarity scale, all of our respondents have a powerful orientation or have a powerful uh, humanistic orientation. We have one cases which was uh, normative, so uh, we removed it, obviously. And this result is in, accord in accordance with previous literature where female were more inclined to be humanistic. So maybe this is why uh, our sample was mostly humanistic. Uh, the remaining respondents were divided in different degrees of humanism as low humanism, moderate humanism, and high humanism uh, to respect with um, dividing them in, in quartiles. And the last hypothesis, which is the hypothesis seven, could not be supported because it was about normative uh, participants. So it, can we, um, we didn't have them. After the distribution of the participants according to the humanism degree, like the levels, we perform a t-test to explore how perceived traits of the avatar are distributed across uh, humanist sector of the participants. So the results of the t-test reveal that following uh, relations are significant, uh, are statistically significant. So participants with high humanism perceive the avatar as less attractive but more uh, more expert, more knowledgeable, and the message of the avatar is more credible for those in high humanism. Um, as conclusion, we see that the type of the avatar does not affect the perception of the source and the message credibility, like if it's a, a non-expert or an expert, like affiliated or non-affiliated, but the personal ideology could be a possible factor for this. A uh, different degree of humanism could change the way we look at virtual messages, sources, and the credibility of the message. And people high in humanism saw the avatar as less attractive and more knowledgeable and the message as more believable. So uh, as every study has, our study has some limitations and there are the small size and homogeneity uh, of our participants in age, gender, and individual uh, ideology. And this is probably, um, an answer for, for our sample that was full of humanists is because uh, female are more humanistic and in this age um, interval, like 18, 25, um, young adults tend to, be, tend to be more progressive, more open about different stuff and more experimental, like we're talking about millennials in general. That was one of our limitation. And the other limitation was the extraordinary context that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and maybe our um, choosing this uh, specific message was not um, was not okay for this con this context because it was overly shared and overly uh, the participants know know it very well. Our recommendation for future studies is to have sizable differences between the two experimental stimuli. We think we think that maybe there were not there were no differences. Um, visible in, in between the, the type of the avatar because they were similar in how they look. So maybe more differences as uh, hair color or uh, face type, whatever, could be run in the future. Testing other types of messages that are not related to the pandemic uh, context and bigger and diverse sample of participants like comparing young people with senior citizens and having a diversity uh, in respect to age, gender, and ideological orientation, uh, especially to have normatives in, uh, in the sample to have uh, to compare them. Uh, so at the end, the presentation reviewed the key findings of our research and accentuate the fact that we should devote more attention to the study of the personal ideologies as moderators for source and message credibility and to see if digital avatars could be an effective alternative 
today's co communication in public health um, in public health campaigns. Thank you for your attention, and these are the references. Thank you very much, Adina. Thank you. Um, if uh, any of the attendees have questions, please free to address it. If there are no questions, we can proceed to the next, uh, next presentation. Uh, which belongs to Florinella Mocano and Georgiana Manole Andrei. Um, I guess there is a question in the chat, ah, but not sorry. for me. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Uh, it's a question for the first presentation, but you can answer also uh, via chat. Okay. So. Uh, Florinella and Georgiana uh, couldn't attend the conference, so we, we invite uh, our colleagues um, Sebastian Fitzek to, record, uh, to display their recorded uh, presentation. Sebastian, are you in? Yes, I am here. Please, uh, share the screen. Can you see? The yes, screen? we can. I hope the sound it, it will be working. Uh, it's working, but it's really faded. Like we can't really understand. I, I can't really understand the the words. Uh, uh, can, can Neither do I. Neither do I. Um, you can you can hear the the sound. The yes, voice. We we could hear the sound. I could hear the sound, but I do not understand the voices because they are like they are speaking far far away. Okay, one moment. Uh, that will be a problem because uh, the the sound, I, I mean the sound, uh, can be uh, going in an echo, and that's why we can't uh, we can't uh, read we can't hear uh, clearly. One moment. I can I can hear you very well. Is better so, or uh, doesn't work? Not, not really. Uh, could you could you share your sound and then uh, go to max volume on your computer? Uh, I don't know how to share the sound. I can uh, share just uh, the presentation. Uh, what you do? Sorry, Sebastian. Um, you have to when you when you share your screen. Yes. Uh, uh, in the left side down, there is a button that you have to click, share with computer sound. But you oh. have to stop share your screen now. Okay, and okay, okay. Yeah, uh, may, may I think you are right. So I have the shift screen, the share screen. Yes. And, and down, on your left side on the screen. Yes. You have to uh, click there on share with computer. Sound or audio. Advanced share option I have here on the share screen. Yes, when you start sharing your screen, you should just moment. start sharing and there will be an option on your left side. Ah, okay. Uh, one moment. I am not expert in Zoom, sorry. I am searching to do my best. Uh, Corina, I, I, I just have the share screen. I give it the share screen. I see the yes. presentation. You but the presentation you want to share. Share computer sound. Yes, I found. I found you. Click there. Optimize screen sharing. No, just share computer sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully, we can solve the problem. One moment. I give to the beginning again. One second. Now. Hello. And together with my colleague Georgiana Manola Andrei, we want to give a perfect day for today. We are PhD students at the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Bucharest. Our paper is uh, entitled Media Representation of Coronavirus in Romanian Online Press. National European and International Themes in Images and Headlines. 
In this research, we wanted to know what happens uh, in mass media when a new context like this, like this generated by a coronavirus pandemic um, appears, mostly uh, considering the social climate change. Also, we chosen this uh, subject because we consider that mass media plays an important role in, um, uh, in maintaining the mental health uh, in normal, uh, at a normal level, in a situation like this, generated by a uh, emergency situation, we consider that uh, symbols used in uh, online uh, press, used in images and headlines, are the main factor in the communication of the messages. We, uh, our. Um, research. It's uh, based on Laswell theory, and uh, this theory said that uh, mass media plays an import plays three important roles. The first role is the surveillance of the environment. The second refers to the correlation of the different components of society responding to the environment, and the third role uh, refers to the passing societal hatred from generation to generation. Um, we know that media contributes to the building of mental maps and um, we um, we found that during the crisis period the messages can be affect, can be uh, alterated by misinformation mostly during this uh, uh, crisis situation and the emergency situation. Um, we know that uh, the first case of coronavirus was in China in December 2019. In uh, Europe, the first case appeared in uh, January in 2020 and in Romania in February 2020. And until now, um, almost uh, was almost 129 million cases worldwide and almost uh, 42 million cases in, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, Romania ranks the 12th, um, uh, the 12th spot of coronavirus cases and our data were collected in April 2021. to discover which of the themes are most represented in our uh, news uh, online newspapers uh, from the national, European and global themes. We uh, constructed a content analysis of online newspapers. Uh, the period we cho we've chosen to analyze is 13 and uh, till 15 March 2020. This was the period uh, pre-emergency uh, state in Romania. Uh, we analyzed three uh, online articles based on the most uh, trafficked um, ones in Romania, which are DG24, Antena 3, and Evenimento Zile. We had uh, 569 articles totally. Uh, if you can answer to we analyze the second, all the uh, uh, images, headline, uh, and uh, uh, the images and the headlines and in, uh, in articles uh, in uh, three different contexts, and it's about the national context, the European, and the international. And we have analyzed ten main uh, topics, and you can see here: mobility, it's about mobility, sports, medicine, politics, economy, religion, and uh, others. We choose the articles that um, have the coronavirus tag, and we observe that uh, the. Um, online press have a special section about the coronavirus and you can see in, uh, in these uh, images um, this uh, thing. The first objective was to discover which uh, of the themes from national, European and global or international are most represented. In the headlines, in both headlines and images, we have the national theme 
uh, in the headlines with 53% and in the images with 44%. For the headlines mentions, the second most most uh, encountered is the European theme with 17% and the international with 16%. Discussing about images, uh, we see ranking uh, second place and third place. Um, all all images, all all uh, themes, and also neutral because uh, some images were. Uh, were used uh, for different types of articles because we're uh, showing um, neutral uh, uh, neutral scope in that. We also have uh, the international being more present in the image distribution with 13% and then European with 11%. The, Im the common images in the category of neutral included medicine, included uh, photos of medics or paramedics uh, in the hospital, and also uh, the coronavirus representation or, uh, uh, or different um, uh, images in this place. Also, we can see some in the neutral that were included more uh, strong and powerful messages like the end of the world is coming and who will live after this. So, this is uh, the conclusion here. And the second uh, objective of our research is the assessment of uh, the most mentioned topic in the article's headline. And um, uh, most we observe that most uh, articles have only one topic in images and also in uh, headlines, but some of them might include uh, two or three images. Here you can see that uh, the medicine was the main topic represented in headlines, uh, domains, and uh, followed by internal affairs, politics, uh, and social cultural issues. The third objective uh, measure the images domains distribution and um, again you can observe that medicine was the main uh, the main topic uh, followed by politics uh, internal affairs and uh, social cultural problems at the same level. Some images represented uh for for the topics mentioned before were medical including uh, uh general uh, mobilization messages that we need to stay home and protect ourselves and also uh, paramedics taking people in uh, uh photos of people who were infected or uh, uh images of medicine this is a radiography of how the lungs uh look like when having the disease uh, we also find some uh, images of public figures in the political domain like Trump, uh, Justin Trudeau or Angela Merkel. The internal domain uh, show uh, how, uh, uh, what internal measures we're taking and uh, how we need to uh, bring Romanians home that need to be home in this period of time. Uh, the social cultural included uh themes like uh what's happening with the school programs or um uh, how the lives of the people were uh, different with uh, the coronavirus we see here a mobilization uh, uh, in italy of people singing from their balconies uh, in terms of support for each other the economy domain also was represented of uh how the economy was will be uh, affected through finance, uh, also to how the banks uh, will uh, respond to this. This is an image of uh, two people at Disney having hazmat suit. The religion domain is very important because it was the period uh, coming up to the Easter. So Romanian had uh, Romanian and uh, Christians in general had uh, customs that need to, to be uh to be uh followed so these are some uh images with the pope uh having uh, appear public appearances to talk about that um when we talk about the other domains um we 
um, we you can see here um, um, we can see here the differences between the other domains uh, representation in images and the other domains represent, uh, represented in headlines and um, when we talk about the images representation, we can see that the public figure was the was the main topic, and also in uh, in headlines representation, um, we can see that uh, inter um, international politics was the second uh, the the second main theme uh, represented, also in uh, images and the headlines, and in images media was the third, and in headlines. Um, measures against coronavirus was the third um, domain, the third topic represented in uh, headlines. Um, we uh, found a lot of um, articles uh, in terms of other domains about food supplies and about people uh, that buy a lot of food things, a lot of foods uh, for the emergency situation. And um, also, we found some uh, articles with strong messages and in the same time uh, with funny, maybe funny messages uh, like this about um, about disin uh, disinfectants, may, uh, you can see, and uh, about uh, stop stealing the medical alcohol. Um, also, we find we found a significant correlation uh, at the medium uh, medium level between the headlines and in the images, and these things mean that when um, uh, the images team uh, means that the images team is the same time with the headline uh, team. And um, we observed that uh, uh, based on the topic, we found strong correlation between domains like politics, medicine, mobility, social cultural issues, and internal affairs. The fifth objective uh, measured the relation between the topics represented and the theme of the articles. Uh, we can see on the national team the highest representation on politics and internal affairs. Um, on the European team, the highest representation were sports and mobility because topics related to the European Cup was, were discussed and also with the people uh, traveling within uh, Europe or coming home uh, for Easter. International team a uh, representation it's on economy and social cultural uh, because uh, we find a lot of articles related to uh, how the the finance uh, uh, is going if the economic will uh, drop uh, economic uh, uh, goodwill will drop uh, because of all of the incapacity of work of people and all topics related to that Uh, we can see uh, the national team is the best represented on both headlines and images. Uh, for the headlines, we see the European team being more present than the international. Uh, although in the images we have the reverse thing, we see more images in the international team than we see in the European one. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, we, we see a strong theme representation on the national stream, as we firstly thought. Uh, so uh, this uh, hypothesis was confirmed for us. Um, the most articles were included on the national scale, but we uh, also had neutral in terms of images. Uh, the national team was the main team represented overall. And we observed that medicine was the main topic represented in uh, images and also in headlines, and um, followed by uh, in headlines internal politics and social cultural. And um, when you talk about the images, followed by politics and internal and social cultural um, issues. And uh, we, uh, you can see that internal and social cultural issues was on the same, uh, were on the same level.
talking about our research limits, so uh, one of them is the repetitiveness of some articles across the three newspapers in the same day on in the three days we analyzed it. Um, the omission of the articles which were not tagged by the newspaper as related to coronavirus and also the short period of time we analyzed it, even though we have a, a big number of articles in that time frame. Future research may include uh, the apply, to apply the same content analysis uh, in uh, March 2021 and see what's the status uh, in this period of time. And also another one would be to actually compare what happened in March 2020 with the results we retrieved from March 2021 and see how this evolved. We were Florina Lamoncano and Georgiana Manole Andrei. Thank you for uh, watching our presentation. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at the uh, addresses shown here. Thank you so much and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Inela and Georgiana. And uh, as the authors mentioned, uh, you can uh, ask them question on uh, email or by chat. Um, if uh, in some cases I skip uh, some questions regarding uh, other presentation, please uh, write it on the chat. And now I will invite um, Amelia Vaida from uh, Aldizi Activity Center from Cluj Napoca to uh, present uh, her work on consumerism in pandemic changes in uh, Romanian's shopping behavior. Amelia, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amelia Vaida, and uh, this is my first research paper and my first participation to a conference. So I hope I will live up to your expectations especially due to the fact that I didn't have any guidance from a professor. Uh, I did this as I want to apply for a PhD this year and I really thought this could help me to gain experience. So uh, my paper is called Consumerism in Pandemic, Changes in Romanian Shopping Behavior. The paper is structured in the following way, uh, an introduction, a theoretical part where I focused on topics such as consumerism, turbo consumerism and digital consumerism. And I discussed communication in regard to digital consumerism and I looked into Facebook as a shopping platform. Then I presented the research design and method, the findings and the discussions and conclusions. The context. Uh, in this day and age, everything, we, uh, everywhere we go, our life is pervaded with state-of-the-art technology. And uh, a landmark of our times is the people's insatiable thirst to buy and to consume. But consumerism is also changing along with the events and technology. And on top of this, in March 2020, authorities announced the outbreak of a pandemic, what, uh, what would modify the consumer's behavior and uh, the people's psychology considerably. Uh, in order to limit and prevent the spread of the contagious disease, uh, a myriad of measures and restrictions have been taken, all of which affecting the normal life uh, of the citizens in Romania. Social distancing was imposed and citizens were asked by the authorities to limit the meetings, the outings uh, for shopping, for instance. And this is the context in which digital technology steps in as an adjuvant for consumerism and for maintaining a relatively normal life as all the people's outside activities moved online, especially shop shopping, sorry. The motivation behind. Um, this study is essential both for retailers and for humankind, I would dare say. Uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic, the majority of the transactions moved online and the digital technology, implicitly a smartphone or an internet connection, became the greatest asset a family can have. 
uh, technology became a lifesaver, preventing people from literally going crazy. And at the same time, being the easiest way to obtain food and creature comforts. On the plus side, uh, the attitude towards buying changed um, and the companies must know where to advertise to have the maximum impact in potential customers and how to advertise to obtain sales. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the Romanian landscape hasn't been given or has been given little scholarly attention in regard to this topic. Thus, this paper aims to fill that gap. Uh, theoretical framework, um, consumerism. Uh, according to the definition provided by Investopedia, consumerism is the idea that increasing consumption of goods and services purchased in the market is always a desirable goal and that a person's well-being and happiness depends fundamentally on obtaining consumer goods and material possessions. Uh, nowadays, people are psychologically addicted to buying mostly unnecessary possessions just for the sheer mental comfort resulted from our identification with the purchased goods. In other words, as Neil also noted, we are what we buy. The second concept I discussed is turbo consumerism. Neil Lawson uh, is of the opinion that between the 80s and the 90s, the society went through another process of change and uh, consumerism became turbo consumerism a trend that became dominant of the early 21st century. Uh, the reason uh, behind this shift is considered to be the evolution from a life of insufficiency to a life of prosperity and freedom of choice on the one hand, and on the other hand, our identity as individuals. Uh, in the past, all the people were labeled according to their family uh, and occupation and were confined to those signs. But nowadays, buying gave people the chance to become someone else, to belong to a different group, to be perceived through their possessions. Uh, therefore, everything they buy are symbols of who they want to be. Uh, digital consumerism. Uh, the internet has become a vital part of our life and this is due to the cutting edge technology that surrounds us. Uh, in 2019, there were over 4.1 billion internet users worldwide. In January uh, 2021, there were 4.66 billion users and experts foresee that by 2022, the number of internet users will reach 6 billion. Uh, the digitalization changed the shopping behavior patterns and habits, as now the aim of people is not necessarily to go to the malls and shop, but to buy from wherever they are, from their cozy homes, offices, or even when they are on holiday or on the street. Uh, they use digital technologies uh, basically to buy everything they need. And the impact uh, resulted uh, is huge and emerged as a new pattern that uh, characterizes a cornucopia of people, namely digital consumerism. Communication in uh, digital consumerism. Um, if in a not so remote past, the emphasis was on TV advertisements, uh, because all the population watched TV in their homes. At present, this changed drastically as people do not have the patience to watch TV nor time uh, or willingness. And as a consequence, companies had to shift the highlight from TV to online marketing tools as most of the people are online. Thus, companies created uh, and promoted advertisements for popular platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, or different sites of interest that uh, are served nowadays. Uh, whenever people do their everyday routines, they use their phones um, and uh, they see advertisements about products they once sought or talked about. And uh, all this is due to the Google's algorithms, which retrieve data from users' search index and deliver the most uh, appropriate results. Uh, Facebook as a shopping platform. Uh, in Romania, in the last few years, Facebook has started to be seen as the preferred means of free advertisement. 
um, the perfect channel for brand awareness and at the same time, the appropriate place for sales. As a consequence, many companies created the company profile on Facebook with links towards their site. Uh, research objectives. Um, the aim of this study is to outline the cultural changes regarding consumerism, um, which the society, the Romanian society is going through uh, because of the pandemic, digitalization being considered the catalyst of these changes. Furthermore, it seeks to identify the new consumers' patterns in shopping. And for these reasons, it tries to answer the following uh, three research questions. The first research question is, uh, how has the shopping behavior changed during pandemic? The second one is, in terms of emotions associated with, shop associated with shopping, how did they change during pandemic? And uh, the third one, how much impact do the digital advertisements have on people's decision to shop? Um, methodology. Uh, the study was conducted on the basis of an online survey uh, via Facebook applied on February 2021. I applied a questionnaire made by Google Forms uh, to a group of educated Romanian speaking mothers from Cluj Napoca. Uh, the questionnaire contains 18 questions in Romanian, uh, and I consider the sample representative as mothers are the ones usually doing the shopping for all the family. The survey uh, has 183 respondents, with 70.1% of them having an income above the net average salary in Romania, which is 3,321 lei. Findings. Um, comparison in shopping behavior before and during the pandemic. Um, regarding research question number one, uh, the, respondent, the responses of the participants reveal that before pandemic, 1% uh, shopped only online, in comparison with 12% doing their shopping exclusively online during pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, 12% of the respondents did their shopping exclusively from brick and mortar stores, compared with 3% during pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, 25% of the surveyed people did their shopping 50% from brick and mortar stores and 50% online, compared with 40% during pandemic. Uh, before, 4% uh, did the shopping 25% from physical stores and 75% online. And during pandemic, there were 30% shopping, 25% uh, 20, from physical stores and 50, uh, 75 online. Uh, before, there were 59% buying in the proportion of 75% from physical stores and 25% from online, compared with 50%, 15% buying 75% from physical stores and 25% from online stores. In conclusion, uh, we can notice that people shop more online than from physical stores during pandemic. Uh, pandemic compensation consumerism. Um, when asked whether they shopped uh, more in pandemic than before it, the majority of the respondents answer negatively, but uh, namely 76.5%. But 23.5% stated that uh, the amount of shopping in pandemic surpassed the amount before it. And analyzing the data above means that consumerism remained at about the same level for the majority of people with the mention that they shop online. But for the rest 23.5% who shop more, I propose a new theory named Pandemic Consu Compensation Consumerism or PCC. Uh, the name of the term explains the reason behind it. Uh, during pandemic, people have been refused uh, almost all the pleasures which once filled their life, meeting friends, going out uh, at different events or traveling. 
all these prohibitions came as a new reality for people and the old normal became a new normal, the pandemic normal. And the lack of all the uh, normal activities they were used to created basically a hole in everybody's life, a hole that had to be compensated with something else for their mental health. And in the comfort of their home, people started using technology more, namely their smartphones, tablets, laptops, all with, all with internet connection, uh, plunged into online stores and did compulsive shopping just to compensate for the absence of friends, gatherings of all types or social events. Uh, this way the void could be replenished by mere orders of different goods. Uh, according to an article published by Republica, a uh, communication agency, 30% of the people interviewed declared that doing online shopping helps them have a better mood. Uh, emotions uh, during uh, pandemic. Uh, when it comes to research question number two, these were also subject to change. Before the pandemic, the emotions felt by respondents while uh, shopping were as follows. 68% felt enthusiasm, 52% felt joy, 20.6% felt boredom, 2.9% feel anxi anxiety. 0.6% felt sadness and 0% felt fear. And during pandemic, the feelings of anxiety and fear have gained considerably importance as 39.1% of the respondents feel anxiety while shopping and 29.9% fear. So fear appears now. 19.5% uh, of the people questioned feel sadness and 19% feel boredom. Uh, the positive emotions decreased markedly as only 23% of the respondents feel joy and 21% feel enthusiasm. Uh, the last part of the research aims at the impact that Facebook ads have on the people's decision-making process regarding the purchase of a product. Thus, um, as to research question number three, although 65.7% of the respondents spend more time on Facebook in pandemic than before it, so presumably uh, they have more time to see all the proposed advertisements according to their likes or searches, only 14% of the so 14 uh, 14 of the respondents never buy a product after seeing an ad on their wall uh 69.6% rarely buy products after they see the ads and 15.8% are often persuaded into buying which is quite a small figure um conclusions uh, the findings reveal that uh, the COVID-19 situation has a positive impact on the online market in Romania as the consumer's shopping behavior is strongly oriented towards buying online. Another finding reveals that the level of anxiety along with all the negative feelings um, like fear and sadness rose. And this study has also a tremendous importance for the retailers as its findings show that the percentage of people who end up buying a product after seeing an advertisement of Facebook is relatively low. And this is far from the expected result. Therefore, uh, companies should put more effort into creativity and convey a communicative message uh, of the ads more effectively as to be catchy and enticing. Uh, better marketing tools should also be able to create more captivating advertisements uh, with the result of experts being able to predict the circumstances in which changes for purchase are the highest. Um, concerning the limitations, uh, the first limitation of the study is that it revolves only around the COVID-19 pandemic and all the findings about the consumer's behavior are in accordance with the situation of the year and its implications in people's lives. 
further studies in uh, years to come may disclose other issues. Um, another limitation is found in the relatively reduced number of respondents used for examination as it may not be fully representative of today's consumers in Romania. Uh, perhaps a larger or a differently chosen sample might reveal other aspects. For example, women from other cities or more men could be included in the sample uh, or people from all walks of life. As in this study, the majority of the respondents belong to the educated middle class. Uh, moreover, the study didn't delve into possible decreases in family income due to the pandemic. Uh, future research. Um, this leaves room for future research uh, which, could, uh, which could use the identified shopping patterns uh, in pandemic and study them more in depth trying to find associations with different variables that can alter them. Uh, positive responsiveness to ads might also be a subject for further study uh, so that companies could know better the profile of a new type of shopper and when he is more likely to buy and also what to do to make him buy more. Uh, another aspect worth uh, being investigated uh, is the newly proposed theory on pandemic compensation consumerism and at the same time perhaps identify possible connections with feelings. This is all. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Amelia, you are also welcome to other uh, events. Thank you, academic I will. Academic events. Yes, I will from now on. And I hope with better presentations, perhaps. It was very good. Don't worry. Congrats Thank you. for your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions for Amelia? We still have a few minutes. Then we have uh, to close uh, the session because this is the Zoom time. Yes, I see. As we arrive to the end of the session, let me thank you all of you for your presentation. Uh, hope you have an experience, uh, enriching experience. And uh, uh, last but not, not least, at 10 and 30, uh, Professor uh, Kim Song Du, uh, Vice President of the International Association for Semiotic uh, Studies will give a lecture, um, a master lecture. So see you at 10 and 30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank Have you the nice same. Day. Thank you very much. Thank you.